maintaining attention at this hour. Uh, in fact, this title was sort of off the top of my head over the phone, so you had something in front of you, but then thinking about it, it was a good way to, to, to open and start. Um, the dialectics of authority and consent, it's either bound to drive you away or hopefully to intrigue you, the latter is meant. I'm meant to be a bit polemical. I'm meant to sort of uh, try to say that I think we should be thinking twice about the supposedly arch-typical nouveau Marxist. Um, I think his writings indeed were and in many ways are very new, but in what sense? Uh, at the same time, the title is uh, indicate something else. That is, Gramsci both builds on and negates what had already become a tradition of Marxism. Now, this is a very long discussion, but in a moment, uh, the present moment, when most versions of Marxism, which are current, seem to have very little to offer, uh, I think we're now free. Now that we're going through these ritual uh, motions of television programs and so on about 68. I think that helps us to free ourselves from what were the, have been the ritual bows to the sort of the authority of the fathers. Um, I don't know about some of you. You're probably mostly young, too young for this, but uh, I feel that, that you know, I, sort of how adolescent the dogmatic rebellion of 68 now seems in many ways. I think we're now free to ask uh, much more openly: um, Is there anything of use? Say and in, and this too is meant to be polemical, or at the very least try to wake you and me up, in a Gramscian materialism, one which is dialectical, but in a Gramscian mode. Now, in the context of today's conference, it's obvious two areas of Gramsci's work um, would be relevant. That is, his concept of hegemony and his work on the intellectuals. What I'd like to do in a very short talk is simply to put some doubt in your minds that the frequent references to Gramsci um, in these areas are accurate representations of his ideas. And in doing so, I also hope to suggest how he is indeed relevant for a range of current deba debates, or at least the questions he raises are, from, for example, a discussion of modernity and a critique of Enlightenment rationalism, to recognition of the defects of abstract utopianism, he can also give us some insight into the long-term historical reasons why legitimation and credibility are on the agenda. Now, I want to say just a couple of words about hegemony and about the intellectuals, and then go into some of these things in a bit more depth. That is, first of all, with regard to questions of consent. For Gramsci, when he develops this term hegemony, it's, it's in reference to something very historically specific, and that is the modern interventionist state. That is, for him, it's not a sort of voluntary rationalistic strategy. It's not a, a so-called soft option. That is, he places it, he roots it very specifically in the period of the expansion of the suffrage, uh, in the period of the development of mass political parties, parliamentary politics. It's a period in which public opinion counts, that is, governments of whatever stripe have to respond to it, to listen, to try to manage it, to try to influence it. It's a period of the expansion of, social, of the social basis of consent. It's a period of reforms and of vast socioeconomic transformations. And from this point of view, legitimacy of, and authority have to be reconstituted all the time. They're never a given. They're no, it, for him, it isn't a question of consent in general, but of consent to specific concrete policies. And in this he differs fundamentally from the, the sort of liberal, the great liberal uh, classical theorists. For him, Jimmy is not just ideological exhortation, but concrete reforms which provide an answer, not the only one, but an answer to people's varied needs, however they're defined. Now, with regard to the intellectuals, what strikes me is how often he talks about them as specialists, how often he talks about a division of labor, how he's interested in the vast increase in the number of people who, in his words, exercise an organizational function in the wide sense, in production, in culture, in politics. And politics meant both in terms of the state, the state machine bureaucracy, and political parties. How he's interested in the complexity and the expansion of the institutions which form intellectuals. And the key question for him is the nature of the relationship between intellectuals across specialisms 
and between spheres of society, and the relationship between different levels of intellectual skills, from those of the vast majority of people who he, in actually a very old and very classical way, defines as intellectuals as rational beings, between the vast majority of people with their intellectual capabilities, from that level to the highest level of specialization. <coughs> now, in response to the social needs and socioeconomic and to socioeconomic development, and in forms influenced by specific historical, national, and political factors, intellectuals with their specialisms help to determine the content and forms of state policy and social reform. That is the concrete basis of consent. Now, a little of this actually comes across in the, the many, many references that we have to Gramsci throughout the literature. That is, the dominant readings of Gramsci, which are at the bottom of these frequent references to his ideas, are in fact less readings than projections of pre-existing traditions. And in fact, this shouldn't surprise us. With Gramsci, as with any other writer, the easiest way to grasp or appear to grasp new concepts is to try to assimilate them into pre-existing schema. In Gramsci's case, in the Anglo-Saxon world, this has frequently meant that he's been absorbed into a Marxist functionalism in which ideas and culture are giving the attributes of an all-powerful social control, or into a left-wing populism which romanticizes popular culture. The fact that he constantly searches for contradictions within ruling ideas and investigates the split which exists between people's ideas and their material conditions is lost. His argument that a critical analysis of popular culture is an essential starting point for any political strategy, because ideas can have the weight of a material force, is indeed a major contribution to political thinking. But in fact, he's fiercely critical of most of the content of po popular ideas, which are an important element in keeping people subordinate. Now, considerable confusion arises in discussions about Gramsci, because most of the work on him in English fails to appreciate the significance of two essential and interrelated aspects of his writing. First is analysis of the implications of the development of the modern interventionist state since the end of the last century, and the complexity of social, economic, and political institutions and relations that go along with it. And secondly, his concept of passive revolution. Now, I don't, I'll be talking about the first, I won't have time to talk about the second, but I just point you in the direction that that is an, an, an important uh, concept. Now, Gramsci goes beyond Marx, Engels, and Lenin in his discussion of the state because he derives theoretical indications from an examination of the novel features of a complex socioeconomic reality which forces him to develop new concepts. His writings make clear that the political basis of hegemony and the material foundation for the influence of dominant ideas are firmly rooted in the kinds of compromises which must be struck and the reforms which are promulgated in an historical period in which capitalism no longer represents the advance of the whole of society. Concrete reforms which give material advantages to broad sections of the population and radical changes in the productive sphere are necessary if this type of society, that is capitalism in that sense, is to survive in the course of what Gramsci calls its long-term organic crisis. Now, as I mentioned before, it is in the context of these reforms and a profound political, socio so, uh, social, and economic changes that Gramsci is interested in the intellectuals. Changes in the organization of capitalism and problems in the construction of socialism, problems made concrete by the, the Russian Revolution, require him to redefine the very meaning of the word intellectual and to place the relationship between intellectuals and the mass of the population at the center of his work in prison. He is forced to define intellectual in terms of the organizational and connective function, this is, those are his words, rather than the skill of thinking in order to understand reality. The political question of the intellectuals derives from long-term trends in capitalist society and from more immediate historical events, in particular the Russian Revolution and Italian fascism. I'm actually very grateful for you for having put on this exhibit at the moment because it's going to illustrate very well some of the things that I've got to say, the one on the, uh, the colonia for, for children. 
Now, both the Russian Revolution and Italian fascism placed the question of the intellectuals or the experts and the organizers at the center of politics. Fascism gave intellectuals an important political role in its project of reconstructing the Italian state and Italian society. This was articulated as the creation of an authentic, organic, and representative relationship between intellectuals and people. Mussolini sought to win over the experts, to set architects to build modernist cities and various kinds of pro uh, projects, to create institutions of mass culture like radio and cinema, to organize intellectuals in associations, institutes, and academies, to give economists and lawyers and engineers jobs in the state bureaucracy. Fascism's agenda for the intellectuals stemmed from a recognition that they had acquired a political function as a result of the irreversible decline of the liberal state, which meant that the liberal concept of free-floating ivory tower intellectual was no longer viable. While attacking the, the rhetoric of the, of the sort of populist positions taken by Mussolini or, for example, by G Gentile, Gramsci recognized the advanced nature of the way fascism posed the question of the intellectuals. In this, I think he would have absolutely been at one with uh, a whole range of Italian intellectuals in the moment, and also Paul Hurst in being interested in Carl Schmitt. He had no trouble from a fascist prison in recognizing the advanced way in which a number of questions was being posed by um, intellectuals who themselves identified ideologically and politically with fascism. Fascism's very populism, for example, was a sign that the mass of the population had to be taken account of. They had to be addressed in modern politics. The Bolshevik project was very different from that of the fascists. That is, to build a new society on the basis of the political protagonism of the masses. It was only after the Re Russian Revolution that the question of creating a new type of state based on a democratic relationship between intellectuals and people became concrete rather than utopian. The problem of the relationship between the intellectuals, be they army generals or bureaucrats, agronomists or Bolshevik cadres, and the people was posed in dramatic terms. That question derived from the need to defend the Russian Revolution from invasion and counter-revolution, to rebuild the economy and create a new political system to create a new socialist culture, to organize consent, to make the mass of the population literate, and to lay the foundations for industrialization. If fascism reinforced Gramsci's conviction that the que this question of the intellectuals, the relationship between intellectuals and people was relevant, the experience of the Soviet Union could only have convinced him of the enormous difficulties of creating a new democratic relationship between the mass of the people and political power. <coughs> What then were the changes in advanced capitalism which made such a relationship conceivable? And what makes the question of the intellectuals in this sense so important? The answer lies in Gramsci's analysis of the increasing organization of capitalist society from about the last third of the 19th century. The transformation of the economic sphere into organized capitalism with the increasing dominance of trust cartels and limited companies was but one aspect of the increasing complexity of the social and political fabric as mass political parties, trade unions, and pressure groups developed. Above all else, the relationship between state and society changed. The role of the state expanded dramatically. Its impact on society increased and came to influence even those spheres where it did not intervene directly. The expansion of the suffrage, the introduction of a number of social reforms, the increase in state regulation were its response to political and economic pressures. They were implemented by governments of quite different political hues, from Bismarck to Disraeli, from Theodore Roosevelt to Joliti to Lloyd George. In the, imp in the epoch of imperialism, moreover, governments undertook new tasks abroad for economic interests at home, while well, the First World War and then the economic crisis of 1929-30 led to a range of interventionist policies in New Deal America, in fascist Italy, or Nazi Germany, and in a different way, the Soviet Union. These examples were but the latest manifestations, in fact, for Gramsci of a long-term irreversible decline in the non-interventionist liberal state. 
The decline of the liberal state undermined, in fact, the traditional role of intellectuals and meant that the liberal concept of free-floating intellectuals was a myth, a myth, in fact, in the Sorelian sense, an ideology which had an important effect in maintaining a corporate esprit de corps among some groups of intellectuals. In other words, that myth has had and uh, indeed has a function, but was ideological in a very specific sense. It was ideological, not in... Uh, um, in, in the sense that we heard described much earlier on, but ideological in the sense that it could not adequately describe reality. When Benedetto Croce sought to answer the manifesto of fascist intellectuals by arguing that intellectuals could participate in politics as citizens, but as intellectuals they had to serve a disinterested scientific function, he did so in the form of a political intervention, in, his, in the form of his own manifesto, this made his position, in fact, anachronistic. And this anachronistic position stemmed from his inability to comprehend the changed role of the state or the new historical role of the working class and the mass of society. He and Gramsci are talking two different languages when they use the word intellectual. Gramsci uses intellectual in a broad way. He describes it, for example, uh, in terms of a whole series of jobs. This is just some brief quotes of a manual and instrumental character, jobs which don't even have a directional or organizational, don't even have directional organizational attributes. And he himself is very clear that these, this is an uh, unusual use of the term. But he uses intellectual in this way, rather than, for example, using the term petty bourgeois, petty bourgeois or déclassé or some other term. Because it's not only, his position is not only a challenge to liberal traditions, but it's also a challenge to the socialist tradition. Now the difficulty presenting presented to anyone reading Gramsci is to fill the concept in the same way that he does. That is, to the extent that we fill it, in fact, only with, as he says, the creators of the various sciences, philosophy, art, and so on. To the extent that we neglect, the, again, these various words, the most humble administrators and divulgators of pre-existing traditional accumulated wealth and ideas. If we do not think, these are his words, the entire social stratum which exercise an, an, an organizational function in the wide sense, whether in the field of production or in that of culture, or in that of political administration. If we don't follow him in this, if we don't feel the content in the same way as he does, the word intellectual will function still ideologically rather than, and I, again, this is a political use of this, rather than scientifically or analytically. And we will not reach, in his terms, a concrete approximation of reality. Now what Croce, Lenin, and we miss by using an historically outmoded concept of intellectual is the way in which politics and state policy, plus the organization of the productive sphere, define the work of intellectuals, their our specialisms, their our job specifications. Now these are the major structural form, the major structural basis of authority and consent in the world today. Now, Gramsci's position, his approach, is in stark contrast, then, to the traditional liberal view of the production of advanced knowledge. It also challenges the classical liberal view of the basis of the authority of the state, as well as Marx's orthodoxy, and that's what it had certainly become in his time, both with regard to the intellectuals in the state. Gramsci, in fact, argues that although Croce might believe that intellectual achievement depends on the kind of genial creations of brilliant minds, advanced discoveries, in fact, only have permanent effective historical significance in relationship to a structure of knowledge and learning, a web of institutions, and the level and complexity of education, knowledge, and culture in society at large. The great breakthroughs are, in a sense, but the tip of an intellectual iceberg. Now, Gramsci never reduces the intrinsic differences between skills. Rather, he places them within a structured division of labor, which rests upon the foundation of skills possessed by millions of people. The organization of this structure of specialism, specialists, and skills is constantly changing. Gramsci is, in fact, convinced that a division of labor reflects historical advance. He is no populist. The question is not whether division of labor is necessary, but which division of labor exists and for what reasons. Now finally, 
I want to say something which, um, again, this is a kind of leap, but I think to sort of connect up with a number of the themes today that have come up. He provides us with what I consider a postmodernist text par excellence. What is striking is the very form of his writing. I'd argue that the fragmentary nature of his notes, in fact, is not a product so much of the prison regime of necessity as it's a reflection of his attempt to understand the multidimensional and indeed fragmentary nature of reality, to comp comprehend the complexity of com contemporary society, which escapes any schematic reduction. On the contrary, Gramsci always searched for those very contradictions, the novelties, the specificities, the surprises, and he uses this word, which escape the bounds of any kind of functionalist, functionalist analysis, functionalism, or rationalistic utopian projects of whatever political color. And I think in his attempt to grasp that type of complexity, perhaps he furnishes us with a kind of agenda of research which requires uh, um, a whole um, uh, a keep, in a way, to uh, carry out. So uh, with that, I'll finish. Thanks very much. I really congratulate anyone who has any comment at this stage or a question. <laughs> Having said that. Would, would you really conceive of him as some sort of a postmodernist? Uh, in, well, in a sense, or, or was there uh, some very fundamental, bigger issues underlying like, um, like a, a realist of some sort? Well, I think he, he certainly touches on some of the themes that have been discussed and debated in these last 20 or so years. Um, he certainly very explicitly is critical of a certain kind of enlightenment rationalism. Um, he's certainly critical of uh, a kind of abstract rationalistic uh, making of projects. Um, so that, and I think I, this is just very recent in looking and thinking through the kind of, diff actually I, it, the beginning of this was a reflection on how very difficult it is to write about Gramsci and to follow a kind of logical A, B, C type of discussion. You know, you're always sort of touching on things in the order in which it's, you know, it's difficult to grasp. And I, that comes actually absolutely from the way in which his notes are developed. The thing that this will become clear, I mean, those of you who can read Italian, this becomes much clearer when the, the kind of critical edition of his writings, because the first edition that came out and the edition that we have available in English, which in other ways is terribly good, nonetheless was it an attempt to systemize, systematize his work. And it, it does not fit actually in those kinds of categories. It's not really a, dis it's not an intentional distortion or censorship or anything like that. Hardly anything was in fact cut out, but it, it's a reshaping. And the actual way in which he worked, again, is to see the, this, multi-dimensional kind of ball of mirrors sort of view of reality rather than and and to look over and over again to see the specific the the when he talks about historical historical for him has sort of the word two terms one is the is a very traditional classical you know human made in that sense man made but human made artifice but it's also something that on and all obviously created over time but it's the specific the national the, the different that he's always looking for. And I think that comes out very, very clearly in his writing. So in that sense, he fits into many of these things. Whether we slam the label then on him, I don't know. Uh, for the 
common with Gramsci is the idea of the player as being a member of the intellectual. Nevertheless, there's a special intellectual responsibility that would not characterize the bureaucratic worker in the same way. Which would not, sorry. Would not characterize the bureaucratic worker, the petty bourgeois, uh, who uses his pen, would not necessarily qualify into that definition. Could you perhaps uh, help to establish those differences? Um, he actually knew of Bender's work and, and commented in, uh, on it. In, 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 uh, you know, to read his notebooks, one acquires a whole kind of culture of the period in that sense. Uh, no, he's, he's being very political. I've made a lot of leaps in my presentation because it's, uh, it's some parts from a much longer um, essay. Um, it isn't just that he's being polemical, but he wants to insist on the fact that there is a hierarchy and a structure of knowledge and, and that the relationship to, between people with highly specialized, you know, sort of training and the mass of the population is not the relationship between individuals and, and, a kind of, and separate with, with a kind of gap, of st you know, and then up there there are the ivory tower or the, the, the most specialist. That, in fact, there are, there are many finite gradations of intellectual training. And the pen pusher is actually a connection to the extent, for example, that pen pusher may be in an institution which has something to do with um, the formation of intellectuals or to do with, the, with an application of a, um, of a regulation in which um, I'm trying to, I won't come up with a good example, but in a planning department, but I mean, it's part of the whole structure. And so that what really struck me, because I went back and started rereading, I actually arrived at what was a, a, um, a near populist position. And I must say, Roy, I put this in the second edition of the, the book with this um, essay, um, that it was, a, it was a, a, a kind of challenging question at a seminar at the AA that made me start to think about this again. Um, and I started rereading the work on on education and what strikes you over and over again is his concern with as I say specialization, division of labor, um, the way that the structures of institutions for example it's you know our specialisms we all know well we would know it but we don't tend to spend much time thinking about it are defined in different ways in different countries the kind of institutions are very different in different countries so that that's the other sort of area in which he's very interested but he really does use, I mean, those are the quotes from him. I mean, he's saying that there are different grades, but to say they're different grades means that it's a, of enormous difficulty to actually link up in some kind of effective democratic way in terms of an exchange between the mass of the population and the specialists. It's not something that somehow because of a, and this is where he's very polemical with Lenin, although he isn't directly saying that, but we can, we can use his work in a very polemical way. It's not a matter of the specialist then undertaking another political object, you know, um, having a political vocation, an ideological vocation, and putting his or her skills at the, at the service of another class. It's actually a different form of relationship between um, those, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging, he's actually saying that people, that people are intellectuals have a mode, he uses the kind of term, a mode of existence which is um, defined, which is affected by the kind of splits and, and separation that exists between higher levels of knowledge and of political power and the mass of the population. And in a new type of society built very much already on the potential that there is in the present type of society, there is the possibility to construct a new kind of relationship. But it's put out as a possibility, and this is what's very interesting. If you reread his notes and think very seriously of the fact he'd been in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, he's writing in prison in the 1930s, he has the full array of fascist literature available to him, and he's constantly commenting on it. Um, and he's seeing these varying kinds of projects of establishing a new kind of relationship between intellectuals and people. And for him, this, the, the Russian Revolution and the, 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 the attempt to construct socialism in the Soviet Union makes concrete a whole range of problems that someone like Lenin could not possibly even have conceived of. In other words, it, it, it's the problems which he's interested in. It's a terribly problematic thing. But he uses it in the extended way. And, um, you know, that's kind of intriguing. Yeah. Can I follow up that question? Again, by asking about the, the Gramsci's notion of traditional intellectual and organic intellectual. Now, What's always bothered me is, isn't, isn't a traditional intellectual, in fact, an organic intellectual of the bourgeoisie? Yes. And secondly, which links <laughs> into that is the sense in which those terms are being used as a 
kind of slippage between the, the use of analytical terms mm. and those kind of moral terms. Traditional intellectuals are bad things, organic intellectuals are good things. And the, isn't it sort of a dimension you haven't mentioned? Isn't, isn't the notion of the organic intellectual rooted in Gramsci's very traditional Marxist notion, the force of the production? The organic intellectual is, is locked into the factory, into technological development, uh, not in an ivory tower or a university. Now, what happens when the forces of production, as they frequently do, actually change direction? In other words, the term organic, the organic intellectual may well be the fascist or the liberal technocrat, and the traditional intellectual be a solid academic uh, member of the Labour Party who canvasses the <laughs> So the point is that it, it, you, you mentioned it, but it, it, it's why, in a sense, it's, it is very difficult. They are analytical terms, and what he's actually saying, for example, is that those people that, in the form of their, the way in which they consider their skills, the way they, they see their role in society, someone like Croce, perfect example, he saw himself as an ivory tower intellectual. And this derives, on the one hand, from the, this long tradition of intellectuals that go back to the, the, the clerics and, and, and so on, you know. Um, and what Gramsci says, now look, this, these are traditional intellectuals that the new form of society actually needs to win over. And to the extent that they, but then other types of intellectuals in the concrete, perform tasks that help that kind of society to reproduce itself. Whatever their image of themselves, whatever their ideology of themselves, whatever the myth it, it, whatever myth it is that helps them give gives them and others like them an esprit de corps. Their function is organic in that society, and there I absolutely agree with you. But he, it's wrong to see that then the organic intellectual is the, tech, is the technician. That isn't so. What he says is that as capitalism develops, it develops as well as winning over sections of the, what for, for that moment in time were traditional, i.e. forms of being intellectual that go back are pre-capitalist. It all, capitalism also creates forms of being an intellectual, of holding advanced skills, which it needs much more specifically in terms of the of, of production. All right. um, now, for a new project of society, the problem is the following, that in a new project of society, you need to win over what is, to, from your new point of view, traditional intellectuals, who may be those technicians, or those army generals, or those economists, but you don't just win them over ideologically, and this is in the notes. You, they must, if they are to be organic to this new project, they've got to change their mode of being, their mode of looking at their own job, the relationship between their job, their expertise, and this project, and the potential of the mass, you know, in this, in this mediated way, in this division, these divisions of labor, in terms of their relationship to the people in that sense. So it, you, you can't understand it, I mean, I agree with you, but it's not in terms of intellectuals even, I mean, we academics who might identify politically and ideologically with one uh, side are no more organic to a new project than anyone right. else unless in some way, and it's not, it's not a matter of individual and task, but unless institutions and these things then develop as part of it uh, in a different way in terms of a new project. Mm -hmm. Support for being an organic intellectual, yeah. I mean, I think the most interesting thing, if you look at this, that the organic intellectual is identified to some extent in his notes, and that's undoubtedly true, with, a, with the project of a political party, but it actually goes well beyond that. In other words, it's not in any way encapsulated by the notion of a political party. Right, well, thank you very much indeed. Now, um, <coughs> Before you go, can I make a few announcements about tomorrow?